This is part three of lecture two. In this final part of the lecture, we're going to be talking about different research designs that you can do uh, when you conduct your work. So there's basically two uh, research designs that I want to talk to you about today. Uh, that's first of all the correlational methods, and secondly, it's the experimental method. And it's very important for you to know the difference between the two, so pay attention. So um, when, let me first start by talking about the correlational methods. If we use this method, what we can then do is examine the variables, uh, the, the naturally occurring relationship between variables. So we are not influencing one variable. We're not trying to, to uh, uh, in, impact a certain variable. And no, we, we just look what happens if we, if we see how variables naturally relate to each other. So let me clarify this by giving you an example of correlational uh, research. Let's imagine you have the following research question. Do extroverts have more friends than introverts? So you probably are familiar with the uh, trait uh, extroversion. So some people are more extroverted and some people are more introverted. And you might be thinking to yourself, I think people with, who are more extroverted have an easier time connecting to others um, and are more assertive, and maybe they also have an easier time making new friends. So my prediction would be that extroverts have more friends than introverts. So if this is your research question, it would, would be a wonderful question to address by using a correlational design. So what you can then do is use a survey, so a questionnaire, in which you basically just simply ask participants uh, about uh, the number of friends that they have, and you have them fill out an extroversion questionnaire. And uh, then the outcome could be that extroversion is positively correlated with the number of friends, and then this would be in line with your hypothesis. So a positive correlation, a positive relationship between two factors, between two variables, that would uh, show uh, that these, these factors uh, indeed relate to each other. So uh, if you use a correlational design, what you then find is uh, uh, an outcome that you can plot in a graph. Here you see uh, several uh, possible outcomes of uh, correlational research. Uh, this is, of course, uh, not real data. This is just uh, an illustration. So uh, what you first see is a perfect positive correlation. This is something that you never find in actual research. So if you find this, then you're, uh, you're probably related to Diederik Stapel because this just doesn't show up in real life. So just for you to know, this is not what we actually find. But this is just for illustrative uh, purposes. Here uh, you would find a relationship of one a perfect positive correlation. So this means that if you know one factor, so for example, if you know the extraversion score of people, then you can perfectly predict how many friends they have. So the only thing you need to know is their extraversion level, and you know that the more extroverted they are, the more friends they have. It's a positive correlation and a perfect correlation of one. Again, this never happens. So on the very opposite side, you see a perfect negative correlation. Uh, and here, uh, this is a, a correlation of minus one. And uh, this is also, again, a perfect correlation in the sense that you only need to know one factor, and then you can predict the outcome on the other factor. So in this case, with our example, this would be the more extroverted you are, the less friends you have. So a negative relationship between the two variables of minus one. So uh, the, the plot you see in the middle, that's zero correlation. There's no relationship between the two factors. This is actually something that we, we come across as scientists a lot. Oftentimes we have hypotheses, we have ideas, and they turn out to be, you know, untrue. We cannot f find support for them in the data set. So this is something that I came across a lot in my uh, research career, which is perfectly fine. We have ideas, we test them, and sometimes they turn out to be incorrect. So here there's zero correlation. That means that the level of extroversion is completely unrelated to the number of friends that you have. So you can find support or you can reject your hypothesis based on the, uh, the correlation coefficient um, that is always somewhere between one and minus one. And if it's close to zero, then you can reject your hypothesis. Okay, um, when you do correlational research, there's a lot of advantages. You can just study two factors. You don't have to intervene. You don't have to uh, uh, have very complicated uh, paradigms. You don't even have to go to the lab often. You can just ask questions and see how variables relate to each other. But there's a very big downside of using a correlational design. And that is that you only see that there's a relationship. Two factors have something to do with each other. 
but you do not know whether one is causing the other. You do not know if one factor is basically the cause and the other is the consequence or the other way around. So you just know that there's a relationship between the two. Just like you probably would find a relationship between ice cream sales and sunburn. So how much sunburn there's uh, been sold in the stores. There's a relationship there. I think we can all understand why, right? It's not that buying ice cream always sort of spurs, uh, uh, creates you or, or makes you uh, go also to buy sunscreen. No, there's something else going on. And the underlying factor is, of course, the weather. So the cause is actually the hot weather, and that's causing people to both uh, buy ice cream and both get a sunburn or uh, buy sunscreen. Okay, so we see a correlation between two factors, but that's not saying that they have a, a causal relationship. So that's very important to understand. If we do correlational research, we cannot talk about cause and effect. We can on only talk about a relationship between two factors. And we as social psychologists, we do not really like this because what we really want to do eventually is predicting behavior. We want to understand why people do what they do and we want to sort of get a grip on uh, predicting people's um, final behavior. So what we love to do is conduct experimental research. So what is experimental research? This is research in which we create groups, create groups of uh, individuals, um, and all the participants in our research are randomly assigned to the groups, can be two groups or three groups, sometimes more, but then it gets a bit messy. So oftentimes in a research that uses experiments, we have two or three conditions. That's what we refer to, two or two, three groups that are created by the researcher. And um, then we measure something. So we create groups, we influence one factor, and then we measure another factor. So let's uh, again uh, give an example for further clarification. Let's imagine that you have a research question that is, does temperature, so how cold or hot uh, participants are, does that affect how helpful they are? So uh, let's imagine that that's your research question. That would be a beautiful question to address in an experiment. In this experiment, you can divide participants between groups. And you can ask participants to either take place in a cool room or a warm room. If you do so, it is very important that you use random assignments. And with random assignments, I mean that you do not come up with a reason why some people sit in a cool room and others sit in a warm room. For example, your research would not work if you say, okay, all the men go to the cold room and all the women go to the warm room. Because what, what you're doing then is not random assignments. You're using assignment based on, on another factor. So if you find a difference between conditions, then you never know whether it is because people were in a cold or a warm room or because all the men were in the cold room and all the women were in a warm room. So you should never do that. You should use random assignments but over the groups. And then you can test helpfulness. You can, for example, do so in a clever way in which a researcher enters either the cold room or the warm room, drops a box of pens, the participants is sitting there and you just gonna check how many pens the participants picks up. So is this participant actually going to help the researcher when the researcher drops the pens? Will the subject help to clean up? And is there a difference between helpfulness behavior in the cold room versus the warm room? Okay, this is a fake study just for you to remember, so this is not an actual question, uh, but this could be a research design that you could actually do. The advantage of using this method, if you use random assignments, is that you can actually make claims about causality, cause and consequence, because you're actually influencing one factor, in this case temperature, you're sending people either to a cold room or a warm room, and you're testing a difference in helpfulness. So here it is really clear that you have two variables, one is the cause and one is the consequence. And we have s specific names for them in our experimental designs. So we have one independent variable, and this is the variable that is affected by the researcher, that the, the researcher uh, is, is sort of uh, manipulating, and the researcher assumes that this factor is the cause. So in our little example, this would be temperature. Temperature is the independent variable. And there's another variable that we're interested in, and that is the dependent variable. This is the variable that is measured, and the researcher assumed that this is the consequence. So this dependent variable 
It's already in the name, right? Dependent is dependent on the first variable, on the independent variable. In our example, this would be helpfulness. How helpful are participants? Okay, let's look at the fake results of this fake study. Um, here you see uh, what could happen in your results. Let's imagine that this would be what your results look like. On the y-axis, you see the number of pens that participants pick up. And on the x-axis, you see whether people were in either in the warm room or in the cold room. And you see that here, the bars are different, right? In the warm room, participants pick up about seven or eight pens, and in the cold room, about three or four pens. So you see that there's a difference. Uh, then what researchers always do is check the probability level, the P level. And you can do so with, by using various uh, uh, statistical techniques. But this P level, that's vital information because this P level informs us uh, about the chances that the uh, results of an experiment are actually due to chance and not because the independent variable differs between conditions. So this p-value, we like this to be as small as possible, ideally uh, smaller than 1.05. And in this, in our experiment, our fake experiment, the p-value is 1.01. .01. And what this means is that um, this, uh, uh, um, in this example, the probability that the results that we get is actually due to chance, that is 1.01 in 100. So there's a 1 in 100 percent chance that the result that we find here is due to chance. So that's actually, that's good. That's a, a, we call this a significant result, a statistically significant result. So the p-value is something that you should keep in mind. So let's imagine we find this result, then you think, okay, cool, well, this is solved, right? We know that there's a difference. It's a statistically significant difference, so question solved. The only problem with the design that we used in this study is that we only have a warm room and a cold room. So we do not exactly know which of the two rooms is actually causing the effect. Is it that people in a warm room become more helpful? Or is it that people in a cold room become less helpful? And that's a difference. So we are both basically manipulating the factors in both groups. And that's not ideal. This is actually sort of an, not an ideal uh, situation. So let's improve this experiment. Um, let's create three groups. One group with a warm room, uh, the second group in a cold room, and the third group in a room in which temperature is unaffected. This, so so there's no, this just a normal temperature for participants to be in, not affected by external factors. By adding this condition, this is called a control condition, we can actually see whether people become more helpful in a warm room or less helpful in a cold room. So let's imagine we add this condition and this is what the results look like. What is this saying to us? What, how, how can we interpret these uh, results? So here you see that people in the control condition pick up about the same number of pens as participants in the cold condition. And what we can then uh, conclude is that being in a warm room makes you actually more likely to help. Being in a cold room doesn't do much, but it's being in a warm room that really increases helpfulness behavior. If the results look so as this, the conclusion is different. So let's imagine the control group, the people in the control group behave about the same as people in the warm uh, space. Then the conclusion is, no, it's not that being in a warm room makes you more helpful, no. It's being in a cold room which makes you less likely to help. And that's a vitally different conclusion. Okay, so this is all that I wanted to share with you today. Thanks for watching this lecture.